Um, I'm aware that I'm talking about a slightly different topic from most of the other speakers. So really what I want to do is uh, give some technical information, but to take time to explain it and to keep it to a minimum, but and to really try and give you a, an overview of some of the opportunities and uh, issues and, and progress with disensitized solar cells and how they fit into some of the bigger pictures of, of different solar cell technologies. So as was mentioned, I'm a materials chemist and will be speaking from a materials chemistry perspective, but I'll, I'll do my best to keep it general. If you are interested in a very general overview of solar energy in Scotland, I've just recently been a co-editor of this document, which is the Energy Technology Partnership Review of Innovation and Opportunity in the Scottish Solar Energy Sector. So that's a broad brushstroke document looking at all aspects of innovation, jobs, technologies, opportunities, etc. Uh, so if you're interested in that overview, then have a look at the Energy Technology Partnership website. If you, if you Google that, you'll find that. And then in the, in the news section, you'll find a link to this report. So I would, I would encourage you all to have a look at that for an overview. Going back to disensitized solar cells, those of you who work in photovoltaics will be very familiar with this diagram. It's ubiquitously used to illustrate the progress in technologies published by National Renewable Energy Lab in the US and shows uh, record certified cell efficiencies of various technologies over time. And this is updated to basically, basically 2020. One thing that tends to strike people unfamiliar with this diagram is just how many, how many different technologies there are. So as you probably know, more than 90% of the commercial market is based on crystalline silicon and nearly all the rest is based on cadmium telluride. So what are all these other technologies for? So here's the crystalline silicon part here in, in blue. And you can see that these have, in various guises have reached record efficiencies around about 27% uh, to date. Now, what about above that and below that? Well, above that are uh, fairly specialist multi-junction technologies with very high efficiencies, but then built very expensive. So useful for things like satellites or concentrators. And then below that are technologies which are less efficient, but have the opportunity to be manufactured much more cheaply and can be more flexible in terms of flexibility, physical flexibility, but also colored, lightweight, attractive color, um, appearance, things like that. So these sorts of technologies are looking for niche markets. And disensitized solar cells fall into this bracket of simpler, potentially lower cost technologies that fall that um, have a lower efficiency, but are not trying to compete against silicon on efficiency, but are trying to compete in, in markets where silicon is not appropriate. So the record efficiency of disensitized solar cells is more like about 12 or 13 percent. Now these are uh, emerging into commercial uses. So there's this one of the leading companies at the moment is this uh, Swedish company Exeger who are making disensitized solar cells and the, the markets they are targeting are for indoor use in consumer electronics. So that sounds like it's not addressing the terawatt challenge. That's not mass power generation. So how does it fit into the environmental theme? Uh, and the thing to, to recognize here is that worldwide we use about 200 billion primary batteries per year. So that's a colossal use a colossal amount of waste that's potentially being uh, generated and um, even if it's not waste it's a huge recycling requirement so powering consumer electronics and indoor cells is actually a big deal and um, using indoor solar cells to top up secondary batteries and increase the value in the lifetime and the uh, Minimize the use for primary batteries is something that can actually do, do a lot of good as well as being a commercial opportunity. There are uh, demonstration projects where disensitized solar cells are used outdoors. So most prominently this tower in Graz in Austria has some disensitized solar cells installed. There's also a convention center in Switzerland. So there are demonstration projects, but it's harder to 
believe that, that this is the real future of dye-sensitized solar cells outdoors, competing with established technologies. The indoor application of consumer goods is much more um, promising and provides a unique niche that other technologies can't fit quite so well. So very briefly, for those who are unfamiliar, I thought I'd put in a slide of how a photovoltaic solar cell works. So I have a number of layers here in this device. So this is a side-on view of a solar cell device. Of course, you need some material which absorbs light to excite an electron. In a dye-sensitized solar cell, this would be a molecular dye, much like in photosynthesis. And then you need materials that will selectively propagate the, the opposing charges in different directions. So a material that's selective for electrons and a material that is selective for holes so that these are separated to the different an um, electrodes, the anode and cathode. And then that can lead to um, electrons in the outer circuit doing work, photovoltage driving a photocurrent. Sorry, you can hear music in the background. That's our doorbell just rang. Um, I'll, I'll try my best to ignore that. Now, um, the absorber in the solar cell then has some particular band gap. And this leads then to limitations to the potential efficiency, because it may have struck you that something as successful as silicon solar cells have a record efficiency of 27%, which doesn't sound like a lot. But the reality is that for a single um, semiconductor-based solar cell, there will be a large part of the solar spectrum where the photons have insufficient energy to excite across the gap, the band gap. So these are all lost. And then there will be photons that have too much energy. And although, of course, they do contribute to the photocurrent, they've got much more energy than is required to excite across the band gap. So their excess energy is lost as heat. So then um, the end result of that is that the efficiency limit, thermodynamic efficiency limit for a single junction solar cell is around 32%. So actually the um, achievement of optimizing silicon solar cells up to around 27%, that's not out of a possible 100, that's out of a possible 32. So actually it's a remarkable achievement. But it does also mean that uh, this is the solar spectrum. So the, um, the band gap of silicon and other outdoor solar cells are optimized to match the solar spectrum and to minimize these losses. The indoor spectrum is quite different and I'll come back to that in a few moments. So very quickly, I'm aware this is a bit too technical perhaps for today's meeting, but this is the, the same diagram as I showed a few moments ago, but for a dye sensitized solar cell, side on view. So now the light absorbing material is a molecular dye. The electron extracting material is um, titanium dioxide and the whole extracting material in the original implementation of the disensitized solar cell is a liquid electrolyte often based on this iodide chemistry. So what we've we been doing recently, um, so I'm just going to quickly skim through a couple of papers we've published this year, uh, pieces of work we've published this year to give you an up-to-date picture of things that we've been working on in this context in uh, University of Edinburgh. This is all the work of my student, Ellie Tanaka, who actually passed her PhD viral on Monday this week. So um, a celebration of her, her completion, completion as well. And this work is in collaboration with the Freitag Group in Newcastle. So here is, uh, this is basically the quantum efficiency on the y-axis as a function of wavelength. And what you can see here is that for this cell we worked on here, the quantum efficiency as a function of wavelength is high, but only extends as far as about 650 nanometers. And that is insufficient coverage to capture solar radiation, which will extend quite a long way into the near IR. And um, the, this then illustrates the matching of the, of the uh, response function of the disensitized solar cell much better to indoor light rather than outdoor light, because of course, indoor light using fluorescence uh, lamps or LEDs is centered around this visible part of the spectrum. These are pictures of molecular dyes that we're using to combine together to cover the whole spectrum here. And this uh, inset here really illustrates the main point. In one sun, so that's a simulated solar energy, 
we get less than 10% efficiency, so much, much lower than a silicon solar cell. These, however, per however perform well at low light, so 0.1 sun slightly rises. A silicon solar cell's efficiency would greatly drop in lower light, but at 1,000 lux, so this is now simulated indoor light, the efficiency of this cell rises to nearly 30%, and that's because of the excellent matching of the response to indoor light combined with the good performance in low light. So these are ideally suited to indoor applications. Um, very briefly, just to say what we were doing in this particular piece of work was combining a high performing dye, highly optimized, with a lower cost dye in such a way that we got the performance of the better dye but a cost combination of using the two. So it was about reducing expensive components in that, in that device. So I'll just move on then to the second uh, piece of uh, recent work that I wanted to highlight. And it builds on this previous observation. Now you'll have seen that in the general schema I gave, the dye-sensitized solar cell includes a liquid electrolyte, and that's very bad for long-term efficiency because it can leak, evaporate, etc. A few years ago in 2018, uh, this group uh, demonstrated that using a copper electrolyte, copper one, copper two redox electrolyte, it could be allowed to dry out. Normally you expect that to kill the performance of the cell, but actually it worked, and it worked even better than the cell with the liquid electrolyte. So these were nicknamed zombie cells because they should be dead, but actually still perform well or still alive. And this was specifically discovered for these copper electrolytes um, and it was felt to be able to give higher stability because there's no longer a liquid component, although that's not really played out that way in practice. There's no evidence really that these copper solid state cells are any better than in stability than the ones with the liquid electrolytes. So what we discovered this year was that we could do exactly the same using the iodide electrolyte. It's very well established and very low cost. So again, this is the response function as a function of wavelength. Quantum efficiency is a function of wavelength showing that our solid state cell dried out to give a polyiodide is performing almost exactly as well as the corresponding liquid cell. And not only that, so this is a schematic showing that drying out. So the, so the liquid dries out to form a thin layer of the whole extracting material. One more minute, Neil. Okay, almost done. Um, so not only did we show that, that we could make those solid state cells, but also that they had uh, excellent stability. So this is unencapsulated, open to the air, still with actually with a hole in them through which the electrolyte dried out. And um, this is, let's focus on the power conversion efficiency here. We showed that over 8,000 hours, which is a number of months, this didn't really drop at all compared with the original uh, fabrication of the cell. So they seem to have much better stability than, um, than liquid cells would have and that many other implementations of dye sensitized solar cell would have. So that's really promising. So just uh, straight to my conclusions then. So dye sensitized solar cells, indoor use, for the internet of things, for consumer goods, laptops, et cetera, powering things indoors, huge potential. And from an environmental perspective, the opportunity to, re to replace primary batteries. And uh, so these solid state polyiodide cells that we've made uh, by drying out the established electrolyte, very simple and excellent stability. And that could be an interesting way forward. Thank you very much for your attention.